Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Ingemar Church. My name is David Streets. Dennis Henley, Greg Cox, and I serve as the pastors at Ingemar Church. We are delighted that you have joined us for worship today. This is a very special day in the life of the church. It is Pentecost. It is the day we celebrate as the birthday of the church. If this is your first time with us, we are especially blessed that you have joined us because you are an answer to our prayers. We have been praying for you to come. Will you please take a moment sometime during our service today to complete a Connect card online? As we prepare to worship God, hear these words from the prophet Joel. And it shall come in the last days that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And now, let us join with Josh and Laura Roach as we prepare to worship God. Yes, praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise his name. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time on forevermore. Won't you sing with me from wherever you are? Praise his name together. Sing, he's coming on the cloud. He's coming on the cloud. Kings and kingdoms will bow down And every chain will break As broken hearts declare His praise Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah He's roaring with power and fighting our battle and every knee will bow before him our god is the lamb the lamb that was slain for the sin of the world his blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb every knee will bow before Open up the gate. Open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. He's the God who comes to save, and He's here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is alive. Judah, he's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee. stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? No one. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. 
For the sins of the world His blood breaks the chains And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb Every knee will bow before Him Blessed are you, God of glory and majesty, for you announced the coming of your Son, 
who brings joy and gladness to this waiting world. And just as your servant John leaped for joy as he sensed the presence of God in the womb of your servant Mary, so we too feel and cherish the joy that only comes from knowing you, experiencing you. May we lead lives that are guided by this joy and that reflect Jesus and glorify you, O God. Receive our petitions and requests now as we offer them in this moment of silent prayer. Grant us the strength to go to every town and home with the good news of your promise and to proclaim the greatness of your name through our commitment to your peace. Amen. And now as our Savior taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. It's time now for us to consider our offerings to God's work. In the Old Testament book of Leviticus chapter 22, it says... When one offers a sacrifice to be accepted, it must be perfect. There shall be no blemish in it. It then goes on to describe how what is offered to God must not be our leftovers or something inferior, but the best that we have to give. Now that doesn't mean that the check that you write for the offering must be in perfect handwriting. And if you've ever seen mine, you know that mine would be totally unacceptable. And it doesn't mean that the bill that you place in the envelope must be straight from the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, but rather it means that our offerings need to be made with integrity. In Leviticus, it speaks of sacrifice, not simply giving. Do we simply give something and perhaps not miss it at all? Or do we give sacrificially with a true desire to offer to God the best we can give in response to the blessings which he has already given to us. So examine today your practices in giving. Do they honor God? Or are they what they should be? Keep in mind that there are a number of ways that you can make an offering to the church. You can do that online or by mail to the church office. Details are on the website ingamarchurch.org. Also, if you would like to help with local needs in our surrounding community, you can drop off non-perishable items at entrance A of the Community Life Center at the church where you'll find a collection box between 9 a.m. and noon from Monday through Friday. Now please join me in a moment of prayer for our offering. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all good gifts which you have provided for us. We thank you for family, for friends, for church, for opportunities to serve and to be served. We thank you for the material blessings of life and especially for those that are spiritual and eternal. Help us give of our very best and please receive the gifts that we bring to honor you this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Good morning, church. It is really good to be with you and to continue in worship uh, with you this morning. I want to thank uh, Josh and Laura for their worship with us this morning. What a great way for us to, to dive deep into uh, God's presence and God's uh, holy word this morning. I want to start us by... Uh, sharing this word from the Acts of the Apostles in the second chapter, verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. 
all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as, as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they must have had too much wine. Well, then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in these days, and they will prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, we pray a simple prayer today that you would open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us, and after hearing, be inspired to follow you more deeply in this life. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. So once again, I want to welcome each and every one of you to worship this morning. If you are joining us for the very first time or joining us for the first time in a while, we are concluding today our series of burning questions this week. And over the last several weeks since we uh, gathered together as Easter people, we have been answering questions of theology and scripture that all of you have submitted and you submitted back in February and March. Now, I really do hope that this has been as good for you as it has been for us as we've been preparing for worship each week because seeking answers to questions and actually Coming to some conclusions here in worship really should be a beginning to a quest in our life for truth, a quest for truth that will dive into, our, uh, into different topics and into different scriptural lessons so that we can learn more and more about what God is saying to us in our lives. So today we are concluding our series by jumping into ideas surrounding the, the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I really think it's pretty fitting that we would be concluding in this way because for all of the questions that we have been asking over the last several weeks and whatever the direction that we might be and whatever might take us in those messages, we should want through the Holy Spirit's guidance to go further and further each week. We may ask questions each and every day, God, what do you want in my life? What do you want from me? Where are you leading me, God, and how can I know you more? Well, I believe all of those questions, all of those questions that we may ask really are the work of the Holy Spirit that encourages us and inspires us to grow deeper and deeper. My girls have been uh, giving me a hard time recently, and I have to tell you why. I'm a person that enjoys being outside and actually enjoys working in my yard. 
Specifically, I know that this is probably crazy for some of you, but I love to cut my grass. I love to work in the yard. And quarantine over the last three months has actually led me to watch videos on YouTube about how to cut grass. Now, don't criticize me. Already somebody's looking at me a little bit leery-eyed there, but I can tell you that someone out there probably watches videos about cooking. There are some of you who look at videos to find information about DIY projects, and I can guarantee you, because I've seen it happen, that there are some of our youth and some of our adolescents that actually watch videos on how to conquer the latest video game that they want to play. I just so happen to watch video videos and YouTube videos about lawn care. So one of the things that I've been hearing over and over again in these videos is that if you want to have a healthy lawn, if you want to have a green lawn, a lush lawn, you actually have to cut your lawn more than once a week. Cutting your grass in the right way is the most effective way to tell the plant, the grass, to put down roots, to grow deeper, to grow deeper roots, and to grow stronger. So think about it, if you will, with me, to think about it in spiritual terms. If you want to have a deeper, more meaningful relationship with Christ and with God, you have to spend time tending your relationship. You have to put time and energy in it, feeding it, watering it, tending it, and ultimately trimming off the top of everything that does not add life to you. You have to spend time in your walk with God, with Christ, more than once a week. So all of these questions that we should have been answering over the last couple of weeks really is only the starting point. For if you want to have a healthy life, a deeper life, you have to do some of the yard work, some of the hard work, being led by the Spirit to go deeper. But before I go a little bit too far down that path into that discussion, let's take a look at the question. We had actually several questions about the Holy Spirit this week, and because they were pretty similar, I think it's just important for us to look at them together. So the question is this, what is the relationship between the Holy Spirit and the human soul, and how does the Spirit guide us? The first thing I want to say is that today is Pentecost Sunday, and it's probably a great place for us to start in our understanding of the Holy Spirit, for it is the day of the promised coming and the movement of the Holy Spirit that was finally realized by the apostles. That is not to say that the, that the Holy Spirit wasn't moving and active in people's lives, but it was the final time that the, that the apostles finally realized what it was about. And it's often referred to as the birthday of the church, as Pastor David alluded to a little bit earlier. It's the beginning of the movement from Christ's ministry into the subsequent empowerment of those that came after Christ. It is the apostles gathered and so inspired to come and continue the message and invite and share with others a relationship with Christ and ultimately with God. The apostles, we are told, were gathered together in one place, and they were gathered there to follow the instructions of Jesus, or were they there to follow some other kind of practice that was important for them for that day? You see, Pentecost is actually the day for people to gather, 50 days after the Passover events, and it was a festival of harvest. It was a day set apart for the people of Israel to remember the day that Moses had received the law from God. It's important to them to be together observing that day. But as they were gathered, suddenly the sound of a violent, rushing, moving wind came in where they were and filled that place where they were sitting. And as they sat, they had experienced the filling of that place like they had never heard or experienced ever in their life. And there were as if tongues of fire, tongues of flame that came and rested on each of the apostles as they were gathered. And the scripture says that they were each filled with with the Holy Spirit. In telling of Acts, it's not only did they speak to one another and understand one another, 
but the Spirit enabled them. Told within those first four verses of the second chapter of the book of Acts is a powerful telling and a powerful message for us. For it is a watershed moment, a watershed event for those apostles and a fulfillment of so much of what the power of God was doing in their lives and for us as well. Not only was it a time of formation for the early church, but the word fulfillment is also very important for us as we begin to answer the question of what it is that the Holy Spirit is in relationship to our souls as we connect with God. You see, fulfillment, fulfillment is this idea that we see streams of Scripture coming together in our lives. The Holy Spirit coming is a fulfillment of so much of what God is and continues to do in our lives. The same Spirit that came at Pentecost is the same Spirit at creation. God's Spirit, God's breath, God's pneuma that swept across the deep waters of creation and formed everything that was called good. The same Spirit that came at Pentecost was the same spirit that was present when Moses received that law. It is an indwelling and enabling of the church. It is the fulfillment of that law being in us. Fulfillment is important because the spirit that descended upon them and the apostles at Pentecost is the same spirit that descended into Mary The creative agency of God is enabled in Mary as she became the mother of God's one and only son. Fulfillment is that life-giving spirit that descended upon Jesus at his baptism. And when the spirit comes and descends on us, descends upon us in Pentecost, Pentecost, we are seeing the fulfillment of Jesus when it was proclaimed that others would be baptized with the spirit. In Pentecost, we're seeing the fulfillment of Scripture when we remember that Jesus told his disciples that he would no longer be with them, that he would have something else, that there would be this advocate that comes to share with them in their time and remind them of all that Christ was doing in them. And so on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit descended upon them as tongues of fire, and their spirits became intertwined with the Spirit of God that came their spirit, their will, their words came under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And in turn, their words, their will, their work became the work of God. The Spirit then becomes the link, the connection between Jesus Christ, who is now with God in the heavenly realms, but yet connected with us, and we receive the power of the Holy Spirit that continues When Jesus descends upon us, God, who began a good work in you, will be faithful to complete it. I love that scripture verse from Paul's letter to the Philippians because it reminds us that all that God initiated in Christ will continue. For us, that work of salvation continues in the burning of the Holy Spirit. Hear these it says this being confident of this that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. One way that you could say that it is the Holy Spirit that becomes the very work of God in our lives is that it's transforming us and moving us further along in our relationship with God and Christ. I imagine that there are times when you sit here listening to a sermon and, and one of the pastors will throw out one of those significant terms. It, it might be one of those words or theological concepts that, and when, that, when it's said that you actually begin to spin off into thoughts of what is it that that could possibly mean. Well, the last time I shared with you a message, I threw out one of those 50 cent words And I actually said that I would return to it, and so today I thought it would be a good time to re-explore what that means, because not only is the Holy Spirit critical in our work as a church, but it's also critical in the work of sanctification. So there's that word, that word sanctification. Well, what does it mean? In the simplest terms, sanctification is the process through which we become 
more and more holy. And so the, the Holy Spirit is doing a work of sanctification. And sanctification is the way that we become more and more like Jesus and live into the life that God has been calling us to from the very beginning when we were baptized. Sanctification is only one part, albeit a significant part of our journey, and it is the Holy Spirit that dwells in us that is doing that work of transformation, taking us deeper, taking us further, taking us deeper into that relationship, and it's that same way that the apostles became transformed at Pentecost that we too become transformed through the Spirit. You see, when the Spirit lives in us, the Spirit moves us along, it teaches us, transforms us, inspires us. The Holy Spirit is the grace of God in us, and it's making us more and more like Him. The Holy Spirit is crucial for us, for it is the very Spirit that dwells in us that provokes us onto good deeds. If you were here a few weeks ago when I was preaching last, I shared a message first and foremost about our relationship with God, but intermingled in that conversation about Christ, I was also sharing a little bit about how Satan tempts us and moves us away from God's goodness and desire in our lives. Satan is a tempter, a tester, one who distracts us. So here today, I can't help but to share the contrast with the work of evil that is so pervasive in our lives with the work of goodness, that is the Holy Spirit that spurs us on, that provokes us and encourages us to move closer and closer. You see, the Spirit comes, as Jesus reminds us in the Gospel of John, as an advocate, an advocate, the one who is through great words like a good attorney, encouraging us, offering good advice, encouraging us in our search for truth. And so it is that the Spirit, spurring us on within our souls, reminds us of God's love and mercy offered to us in Christ and moves us toward that which God gives the true and realistic point of knowing God's word that is irrefutable, that is the very foundation of Christ, is the way in which the Holy Spirit moves us. You see, truth, truth holds a central place for us in the gospel. And even in the gospel of John, um, you hear even Pontius Pilate say, what is truth? To know God is, and to know Christ is our spiritual foundation. It is the basis of what we want to be in our life, the way, the truth, and the life. To know Christ, to know God, is the very work of the Spirit in us, advocating for us, spurring us on, moving us forward. So in Christ's conversation with his disciples during his ministry, he was always drawing them to the future drawing them to the future and reminding them that he wouldn't always be with them and offered to them a glimpse of what it is that God's love and mercy might be like. And he was proclaiming God's work in their life and in the gospel of John, he wanted them to know that even while he was gone, something else would happen, something that they might not yet understand that would complete his earthly ministry and that the advocate would come. John 15 John, John chapter 15 says, When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. Then the Holy Spirit is often described as being at work in the believer and the, the Holy Spirit is always testifying to the truth that is in Jesus. The Holy Spirit helps us in our spirit, in our souls to understand our actions and our sins, to draw us away from those sins and towards God because without the Holy Spirit, we might tend to ignore our own actions and believe that what we are doing is okay. But we need the Spirit to spur us on, to testify with us, to teach us. One of the great things about the Spirit is that it draws us closer and closer to that truth. 
it's that spirit that draws attention not to himself, but towards Christ. The spirit works only to glorify Christ. Some of you have heard me talk about uh, my trip to Moscow, Russia in 2005. I had the opportunity to travel to Russia as part of a team of folks from western Pennsylvania to go and help on a construction job or a volunteers and mission job in the United Methodist Seminary in Moscow. The entire project was a powerful one for me for a number of different levels, but beyond the construction and the to, you know, the, the way in which we could get our hands dirty. It was a powerful way that gave me a glimpse of just how the Holy Spirit works and testifies in our midst. Our entire two weeks was dedicated on working on this third floor of a building that was purchased by the church to be a seminary, a place of theological education. You see, the first Two floors were already completed, and they were there for offices and for classrooms. For, for our work would then concentrate on the third floor, which would then be dormitory and gathering space for the students. It was the first time back in 2005 that I had to travel so far out of my comfort zone. Not only was it the first time that I traveled outside of the country, but it was also the first time that I was thrust into a new culture, a new language, and for that matter, uh, even a new alphabet, trying to balance that reality of all the, the real reasons that we were there was to also then show the life of Christ living in us to those that we encountered, those that we, um, that we had interaction with, and it was a powerful challenge. So in addition to our work, we had the opportunity to worship with two United Methodist communities while we were there. And because we are a part of a gathered community, we really were only receiving bits of translation during the entire worship service. So we relied on something much deeper, and that was the Holy Spirit. I will never forget the moment of worship that were so recognizable for me in prayer and praise. You see, the, the Holy Spirit spurred us on as if tongues of fire were resting upon us. And, and I remember vividly those moments of prayer. And even as the, the pastor was praying, and I, it felt like I could understand the words that they were sharing, the, the agony and the struggle that they were sharing in those moments. And then the work of the Holy Spirit moved us into even the, the Lord's Prayer, and we understood. It was words of grace and mercy and prayer that flowed out as we worshiped and as we praised Jesus together as the church. But I will never forget that moment when we began to sing something so recognizable that but through a different language and the, the, the language of music, Somehow, as a congregation, we sang, and I understood. You see, that, that first song that we sang was the very first hymn in our Methodist tradition since the time of Wesley. It was, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Now, as an aside, I want to tell you that if you have ever looked up this song, this hymn of faith for our tradition, there are like 18 verses. Now, I can't pretend that I will ever memorize 18 verses or even the 17 that are printed on the second page of hymns in our hymnal, but seven, seven of those verses appear in the hymn that we regularly sing. And, and on a good day, I might be able to sing one or two verses without having words in front of me. But as we were singing and as we were worshiping on that day, in Moscow, something wonderful happened as we sang out the words of God's miraculous love in our lives, each in our own language of Russian and in English, I, for some reason, was able to sing each and every verse, and I did not have one word of that hymn in front of me. That, to me, was one of the most vivid expressions and an outpouring of the Spirit in that trip to Russia, because it was as if the Holy Spirit was reminding us in that time of the real reason why we were gathered together, the real reason that we were gathered together, and it was pointing all to Jesus Christ. Everything that we were doing 
was about Christ. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. If you were to ask me to answer this burning question of this day in one sentence, I will tell you this, that the Holy Spirit is here and present in our lives to remind us of one thing, that is God's love and the work in our lives and to draw us closer and closer to Jesus. For when we draw near to the Holy Spirit, our words, our lives, our testimony becomes that of Christ and the world begins to change. We become a part of God's ongoing work to bring glory to the world through Christ. The Holy Spirit is in us and working through us to change us, to transform us, to transform the world so that in the end, God is glorified through Jesus Christ. And in the end, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved in Christ. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, my friends. That's the work of of the Holy Spirit in us, that our lives might be changed for Christ's glory. So let's take a look at some of the next steps this week. The first I want to share with you is that I would encourage you to read the entirety of Acts 2. I know that that's a big jump, but I want you to read Acts chapter 2 and read it for the way in which the Holy Spirit began to use the apostles in a new way. The second thing is I would love for you to spend time in prayer asking for the Holy Spirit to transform you to expose some of the things that need to be cut out of your life so that you might be changed for the better, so that you might grow deeper and deeper in Him. The third is spend time in prayer asking the Holy Spirit to guide you in some work that you could be doing using your spiritual gifts. I didn't get into that today, but maybe you want to go in and investigate what it is that the Holy Spirit is gifting you to do and do some of that work. And the fourth is, is to consider sharing your story with someone who needs to know Christ, who is in you. Draw on the work of the Holy Spirit, my friends, that the Holy Spirit begins to testify to Christ. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, I give you thanks for this day, for all that you give to us, and for your Holy Spirit. And we pray in a miraculous way, in a powerful way, that your Holy Spirit might descend into this place, descend into our homes, descend into our lives, into our families, into our neighborhoods, into the streets, O God, that you might be glorified through Jesus Christ. Transform us, we pray. Allow our words to be your words our will to be your will, and our work, most importantly, O God, to be the work of the Spirit. We pray this in every prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Who am I that the highest King would welcome? I was lost, but he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed, I'm a child of God, yes, I am. has ransomed me, His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died for me, who the sun sets free, oh, it's free. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, 
of Christ. Remind us of that each day. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. Yes, I am. sun sets free, oh it's free in me, I'm a child of God, yes I am, in my Father's house there's a place for me, I'm a child of God, yes I We're so glad that you joined us for worship today. And we pray that you were blessed and are a blessing to anyone that you meet this week. May your souls magnify the Lord this day. And may your spirits rejoice in Jesus this week. Go in peace knowing that God has turned his face toward you and that you stand in the favor and mercy of Christ, our Savior. We'll see you next week.